The following interview was conducted with Dennis Miller, Director of Sports Medicine and Chief Physical Therapist for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, June 25, 2012 in Stewart Center in the Archives. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, Professor Emeritus of Library Science. Good afternoon, Dennis, and thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, let's start with, uh, tell us where and when you were born and siblings and parents in early years. Well, I was born in a little town of Lamar's, Iowa, uh, northwest Iowa, in 1946, March 26, 1946. Um, uh, my parents were uh, tenant farmers um, near a little town called Ireton, Iowa, and um, so I grew up on a farm there, attended uh, the local high school. Uh, I have six brothers and sisters. Uh, my oldest sister is deceased, but the um, balance of uh, the, the seven children are alive and kicking and have annual uh, get-togethers. Uh, uh, we uh, Tell us a little about grade school and high school. What was that like? Was grade school in town where you were born? Or? I, was, uh, I was fortunate that uh, uh, being born in the 40s, uh, was still uh, in Iowa anyway. They were coming out of the one-room schoolhouse era, and my father was appointed the um, trustee, if you will, of that area school, and the first thing that he did was try to get it closed so that the farm children in that area could be bused to the local town, which was the sign says 500 people, and I think they lie. I think there's fewer than that. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in 1950, 51, when I started first grade, I was bused um, to the small community uh, elementary school. And at that time, it was still a uh, elementary school, high school, all in one building. Um, and they maybe had a four grade high school of, I'm going to guess, around 30 to 40 um, kids in four grades. Um, then as I grew up, the uh, state of Iowa consolidated the community schools, and when I was a seventh grader, uh, they consolidated three towns in uh, Sioux County, Iowa, and uh, we were part of a community district in West Sioux. Uh, schools community district and then I went to uh, high school in the town next nine miles away as opposed to three miles away being raised on a farm mm -hmm. uh, to a high school called West Sioux High School where I incidentally met uh, my uh, future wife my first uh, day in school as a ninth grader mm -hmm. um, and she was from this little town of Hayward uh, People say, "What town is that?" I, you know, it's a, you're in jail and you call for the man, Hey Warden, but it's spelled differently. It was Hey Warden, Iowa, um, and uh, then we had a high school of probably about 400 in four grades, so it got much, much bigger quickly. Sure. Um, graduated from uh, West Sioux High School in 1964. Uh, any organization? Did you have any formed any student clubs or when you were there? And uh, well, interesting being a, a rural setting. Uh, of course, the FFA was uh, sure. uh, quite large, et cetera. However, uh, being raised uh, uh, as the uh, son of a sharecropper, uh, we were told uh, we can't set you up farm and don't farm. You have to go to college and, and so look for something else. And so uh, our involvement by family rule was you could be uh, you could be involved in sports, but you also had to be involved in musical organizations, uh, in plays, etc. So you choose one, you had to choose the other. So uh, that's the way it was. I was uh, uh, played uh, football, uh, basketball, uh, ran track, and I was in the band for four years. Um, what, what instrument did you play? I played a baritone, and. Uh, uh, Honestly, think I could probably still play it if I'm someone. I'm sure you could. could you never lose that. <laughs> I don't <touch>. think so. <laughs> uh, 
I was involved in uh, some student organizations, mostly my junior, senior year. Uh, my senior year, I became, uh, I was the uh, class president. My future wife was a class secretary. I don't know if there was... Uh, you getting leadership at uh, an early age. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, that was kind of my involvement. Uh, I didn't have outside jobs because I worked on the farm. And my the the farm that my family ran was a small dairy farm. Uh, we ran cattle. We had hogs. We had the usual chickens kind of thing. So a little bit of everything. Sure. Uh, uh, Sioux County, Iowa, in northwest Iowa, is a huge uh, um, uh, hog cattle uh, production area. Uh, they do not uh, crop farm very much there. So... Uh, you're busy all the time, and then we have the, the dairy uh, along with it, which, of sure. course, is twice dairy. a day all the time. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so after uh, graduation from, from high school, and I'm the fourth out of seven, so I'm right in the middle. Uh, my two older sisters uh, had gone on to college. My older brother had uh, gotten married and started to farm with his, his in-law, in-laws. Uh, so I enrolled at Iowa State University. How'd you happen to pick the Iowa State? <laughs> That's an interesting story. Obviously, uh, I, I had the opportunity to possibly go to Grinnell College, which is a small uh, oh. liberal, liberal arts college in, in Iowa. But even with the academic scholarship, uh, uh, and, and they had wanted me to play football for them, um, it, it still it was more expensive to go there than it was to go to the state-supported sure. university. And when it came to the state-supported university, my father, who uh, always would say, gee, I wish I could have gone, I would have loved to have gone on into electrical engineering. And I don't know why that was his interest, but he always told the family that we could go to any college we wanted to, but he'd help us pay our way to Iowa State. So we kind of were twisted the uh, to go there, and I was the uh, second uh, in my family to go to Iowa State. I did not want to go into engineering. I was not enthused with all the math that was going to be uh, required, even though I was a fairly proficient math student. Uh, I started out thinking I, I, I idolized my high school coaches, and so I thought that was the way to go. I wanted to go into coaching. I thought I would uh, major in physical education and science and be a science teacher coach. And um, At the secondary level? At the thing. secondary level. I really, that was what I thought I wanted to do. Um, I thought I was kind of a hot shot distance runner. And uh, so I was a walk-on at... Uh, Iowa State, and I had received a letter from their coach, and I think after the fact, I think it was probably just a gener generic letter that got sent to every uh, kind of high finisher in some track meet along the line. And the day I walked in, when I thought distance running, I thought that was 800 meters eight, or 880 yards uh, as they ran then. And uh, little did I know, that's really a sprint. And <laughs> uh, the uh, I went to the first practice in uh, oh, uh, uh, Miller, oh, uh, cross country. And so I ended up in cross country. And, and I, uh, the first three to four weeks of my freshman year at Iowa State, I was uh, going to track practice and cross country practice, I should say. And I was thinking, this is, this is okay. I, I, um, however, I, I roomed with a young man from my hometown who was a pole vaulter on the track team and his father was the uh, local physician in our town and he injured his ankle one day and, and he said to me I have to go to the training room uh, for treatment and I was so naive I said what's that? I had no clue that medical care was provided for student athletes sure. And so he said, well, follow me. You know, so I went with him and sat there while he got treated, and I looked around. I was in awe. Uh, there were athletes from all the sports coming in. And, and uh, a couple days after that occurred, there was a, an article in the uh, student newspaper about the head athletic trainer, uh, 
C. Ray Bickerstaff, uh, and a little bit about what he did, his background, that kind of thing. And then there's a brief uh, uh, part of the article that talked about the use of students in, in the sports medicine area. So uh, I was going to practice a, a week or so later, and I don't know what made me do it. I took a left and went in the training room. And instead of going to track practice, and I, and I said I read the article, I introduced myself to him, and uh, Mr. Bickerstaff said, "Well, if you're really interested, uh, you report to see a senior or a junior student who worked uh, in a different facility, and he would see if I could measure up." And so I did, and within a matter of weeks, uh, in my freshman year at Iowa State in the fall. I just fell in love with sports medicine. And uh, ironically, that student that I had to report to, I later was the best man in this wedding, and he's a, cardi uh, uh, a uh, cardiologist uh, in Columbus, Ohio. Right. And uh, so we have remained friends for, for a long time, yes. Okay. So early on as a college freshman, I, I really knew what I wanted to do. Sure, right. So. Did you get, was that a paid position? Did you get paid as well as a student? Um, there? At that time, uh, by the time I was a junior, I would get some student pay. Okay. And uh, my parents, uh, being tenant farmers, uh, uh, were in a situation financially where I could qualify for a little bit of student sure. uh, um, uh, loans. Ironically, uh, my junior year in, in college, uh, the family farm was sold and my parents had to find another farm to move to. And so my father uh, was able to borrow money from family and bankers and the like. Sure. And so instead of being a tenant farmer uh, my junior year, he became a, a uh, landowner that was deeply in debt. And uh, all of a sudden I started to get grants instead of college loans. And so my junior, senior year, I actually had a fair amount of financial aid to go. Good. But I have to tell you that we were on the quarter system, and I believe my first year, we the tuition was $99 a quarter, and I know for a fact when I graduated in 1968, we were only paying $125 a quarter tuition. So I was able to, to, to manage it. I should interject. I've heard, I've talked to some people who, when they went to school, their tuition was, well, even at Purdue, you know, years sure. ago. And I always, and they say, well, I really shouldn't say this. And I said, well, the researchers will understand putting it in that perspective at that time. Then they'll, they'll get grasp and I said, okay, I guess then that's all right, yeah. you know. I actually have somewhere at home a, 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 an accounting of uh, my college costs. Sure. And uh, from the time I entered fall of 64 and graduated in May of 1968, uh, my total costs, even the two summers I lived on the I campus, can't. were less than seven thousand. And uh, goodbye. <laughs> doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Did your uh, future wife also go to Iowa State? Uh, no, my my future wife, uh, whom you met, uh, uh, Linda. Uh, her her maiden name was Hartman. Linda Hartman. Uh, we went to high school together. Dated in high school. Um, and she she went to cosmetology school and is a is a hairstylist, mm -hmm. and uh, then she took a job in uh, uh, Ames, Iowa, where Iowa State is. And uh, then after graduation, we got married. Good. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you what came next. Did you go? Did you serve in the military at all? I did. Oh, as okay. I, as I uh, graduated in 1968, that's uh, obviously when the Vietnam right. conflict uh, was getting real big. Um, I actually had decided as I went in my senior year in college that I would like to go on to physical therapy school to enhance my uh, medical background to be an athletic trainer. And so I applied to the University of Iowa uh, in Iowa City uh, to the physical therapy school and I got accepted. However, um, being from a very small populated county, as the draft was rolling around, 
Um, they were unable to meet their draft quotas. Uh, so uh, while I could appeal, they told me to get ready to be drafted. And as I finished up my, my uh, college undergraduate career at Iowa State, the, again, the head athletic trainer, uh, Mr. Bickerstaff, was good friends with the head athletic trainer at the United States Military Academy. They had a background from prior to both West Point and Iowa State. And what I didn't realize and, and learn then was that uh, at the United States Military Academy and probably the other academies as well, they supplemented their staff, uh, much like uh, colleges nowadays will supplement with graduate students, mm -hmm. they were supplementing their staffs with uh, young graduates from undergraduate school who were being drafted into the service during the Vietnam era. And so I was extremely... At the academy. At the academy. So I was extremely fortunate that they had someone getting out of the military and the athletic trainer at West Point told my uh, mentor at Iowa State that if if he will get in the service as quickly as possible, uh, he I had to go to basic training, and then he would request that I be assigned to the academy. No guarantees, uh, but to get in, and not even wait to be drafted, uh, to volunteer for the draft. So uh, I was encouraged to do that, and I trusted them, and... Uh, it's ironic that I, I, uh, I graduated from Iowa State the last Saturday of May. Uh, my wife, or my future wife, and I got married the first Saturday in June. And then I left 10 days later for basic training. Uh, went to uh, uh, Fort Bliss, uh, Texas, and was, uh, went through eight weeks of basic training. And then at that time, my, actually my first orders coming out of basic training were to go to advanced um, training in uh, Fort Ord, California, but then they got changed and I was reassigned to the United States Military Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then I yeah. flew home, picked up my wife, and drove to the academy, uh, checked in, and then I was uh, assigned there the balance of the two-year uh, military uh, requirements. So uh, that was a lucky. Very, very nice. <laughs> very nice. Right. It allowed me to get two years of experience in right. my chosen profession. Right off the top. Right off the top. It allowed. It allowed the. You know, I can. You can paint it any way you want. Uh, obviously, I didn't go to Vietnam because uh, that's where everybody was heading. Sure. Uh, and. Uh, but at the same time, the the, uh, the the military was able to take advantage of my undergraduate training um, without a lot of additional expense, and it, it was a great experience for me. Living at the academy was a fabulous experience. Did you live right on the grounds as well? Or um, did you have to actually, I lived in an apartment off the academy grounds. You had to be a E5 or sergeant or higher to qualify for military housing. So if you were less than that, which we were, you you were given a quarters allowance and you lived off, sure. which is great. Oh yeah, yeah. And so uh, my nice. wife my wife found a job in the styling salon at the the army commissary right on the post, and so we lived off uh, off post for two years, and it was right. a very exciting times. I was assigned to army football. Uh, I was assigned to preseason basketball. Up until interesting, up until the Army Navy game because of facilities, and then in the winter I was assigned one year to wrestling and one year to uh, ice hockey, and uh, then in the spring I was assigned to spring football. So I got fabulous experience in in sure. my chosen area. Absolutely loved it. Um, uh, it was. And just, didn't I read you? Was that the time when Bobby Knight was there? At well, at, at the time I was there, uh, Coach Knight was the basketball coach, and so during when at that at that time basketball was allowed to start practice October 15. The Army Navy game was usually the first weekend in December, 
So between October 15 and the first weekend in December, I would cover basketball uh, after football started just because of the way they utilize their facilities. And then when the Army-Navy game was over, I'd move on to wrestling or ice hockey, and someone else took over basketball. Mm -hmm. So we were acquainted. In fact, uh, our my wife and Coach Knight's first wife were quite good friends. They would go to craft classes together oh, and do things together. What a small world. A very small world. <laughs> uh, and it was a unique setting because the my second year there, I was assigned to ice hockey. Well, the head hockey coach, uh, Jack Riley, was the U.S. Olympic hockey coach when the U.S. won the gold medal in Squaw Valley in the 60s. Now, uh, most people think of the later one yes, in, yes, in, in, Lake, in, in Lake Placid, but he won the first one. And so he was a really unique unique oh. and a highly qualified coach. And in fact, I believe his son is his son is now the hockey coach yeah. at West Point. So it was a it was a really what really a great, rewarding great experience. Your career. Yeah, yeah. Right. Now you also then uh, was it after that that you got, went to did your graduate work at Syracuse <clears throat> after you? Yes. When I uh, as I came out of my two year commitment uh, in the military, which was at West Point, uh, at that point now I was. Uh, professionally uh, unsettled. I didn't know if I wanted to go back to physical therapy school or I wanted to get my master's degree. And, and at that time, physical therapy school education was either postgraduate certificate of physical therapy or a bachelor of science. And so I decided then to try to get a graduate assistantship and I ended up at Syracuse University as the assistant athletic trainer and I did my master's degree work uh, at Syracuse University from 1970 to 72. So okay. I lived up at Syracuse in the snow country. Loved it. Uh, uh, it was a great experience again. Uh, the Orange Men. The Orange Men. Uh, the other nickname people don't know about them is they were called the Saltine Warriors. And there's a huge statue, a uh, unique statue of, of uh, Native American on the campus. Uh, apparently, uh, early on, the uh, Syracuse, New York area was, uh, they had um, uh, salt mounds there and a lot of the uh, transient uh, Native American tribes would come through for salt. And so that was a, kind of a unique little thing that people don't, that's long since kind of oh, yeah. uh, forgotten in the, in the Syracuse. But it's lot. nice to have, to know that, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And so I was there for two years, got my master's degree, um, at Syracuse, it was, it was a great experience. Was it then after that that you came to Purdue? No, at, 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 as I finished up my, my uh, master's work at Syracuse, then that bug of using physical therapy as a, as a uh, allied medical profession to make myself a better athletic trainer kept coming back to me. So then I applied to uh, uh, several physical therapy schools one of the schools that I applied to is I reapplied to the University of Iowa where I had been accepted way back in 1968. And ironically, I, I, didn't, I didn't get uh, reaccepted. And I was all set to go back to the University of Iowa and work in their athletic area uh, with their head athletic trainer, but I didn't get accepted. So um, make a long story short on there, I got accepted to Columbia, I got accepted to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, and I accepted the the uh, admission to the University of Pennsylvania in, uh, in Philly. Uh, about the same time, Iowa called back and they said, ooh, you were drafted. We cannot turn you down just like you are guaranteed your job. But it was too late. I was already accepted at Penn. And so then I went from Syracuse to Penn in Philly. And uh, I, I went through the University of Pennsylvania uh, postgraduate physical therapy education program and uh, I actually graduated from there in September of 1973. However, the last six weeks, eight weeks, um, you, you did clinical affiliations around the country and my very last clinical affiliation was at Purdue under uh, William E. Pinky Newell who was the head athletic trainer, physical therapist at the time here at Purdue. And so 
he had an opening. I was looking for an opening, but I needed to finish my last clinical, and we arranged for me to come to work for him and finish the clinical all in one. And uh, so I arrived at Purdue in, in July of 73. Okay. And the rest is history. The rest uh, is history. Tell a little bit, you were the head, the assistant, but tell a little bit about head of athletic training with 77 to 2000. What, uh, right. Uh, uh, the, the position that I came in in 73 was a split appointment between the student health at the time was a uh, an accredited student hospital and athletics where I where I was the uh, assistant athletic trainer assistant physical therapist mr. Newell was the head athletic trainer and director of physical therapy in the in the hospital um, in 1977 mr. Newell retired from athletics he actually had been given presidential tenure by dr. Hovde and so when he retired from athletics, he became a lecturer in, um, well, now we'd call it health kinesiology. I forget the title. Physical of education. Physical for, education. And it used to be physical education for men and physical education for women at Correct. one time. At one time. Sure. It, they were combined at that time. But That's he, right. Uh, but prior to that. Prior to that, they were separate. Yeah. He, um, uh, and so he, he remained as the director of physical therapy in 77, uh, and lecturer in, in physical education. I became the head athletic trainer uh, for athletics and remained the assistant physical therapist uh, in the health center. And what, what we did, and we still do today to a certain degree, is in the mornings on campus, student athletes and all students that uh, have prescription for physical therapy come to the student health center now physical therapy and we treat it doesn't matter whether you're a student athlete you're in the band you're a, a intramural athlete a free play athlete uh, but this or, is when or, physical therapy is available and that's and physical therapy is available to all 40,000 students and so and it still is sure. and so so we would treat our student athletes there in the morning we had a larger staff in the afternoon the, the treatment for the student athletes moves over to the Mackey complex and we maintain a, a lesser staff with, in the health center in the afternoon. And so in 77 I became the head athletic trainer and assistant in there. And, then, and that arrangement stayed that way until 1985. And Mr. Newell retired from the, from the university in 1985 and then I was named Head athletic trainer and director of physical therapy in 1985. Oh, okay, okay. Um, tell for the um, if you make a comment on the physical therapy and push for the researchers, you you addressed that a few moments ago that it's open not only to the athlete but now the facilities have changed a little bit. Am I correct in that? Uh, well, the, it, that the, they can uh, you can go to Mackey. Uh, yes, uh, uh, the gotta, the what the health center provides x-ray, urgent care, physical therapy, okay. et cetera, to the campus student body. And it's not a resident hospital anymore. It is not a resident hospital. It has not been probably for a long, for a long time since the probably the late 70s. And, and just with the changes in health care, it downgraded. Uh, we, at, in the 70s, 60s, and obviously before I came, they had surgeries there. You, you know, if you had an appendectomy, you'd be right there. Okay. Uh, we did our athletic surgery there but it became too expensive for the surgeon and the anesthesiology to come in so we would take the athlete somewhere else um, so it, it downgraded to a, a health center and it remains such today and we provide even today we provide physical therapy services to the student body as as uh, needed uh, and we probably see anywhere from six to eight thousand patients a year in our physical therapy department uh, of the student health center. Now it's kind of a, a unique uh, relationship with the same staff that provides the sports medicine services for the student athletes, as well as the physical therapy services for the uh, student body. Uh, it's it's the same. The young, the youngster playing in intramural basketball is just as concerned about playing on Friday night after class as as the young man is on Saturday, 
And uh, so it's, it's a unique relationship. Um, and it provides uh, to our athletic training curriculum another clinical experience for Purdue students who want to become athletic trainers or physical therapists. Uh, it's another setting for a, a, a nice educational uh, opportunity. And that's one of the neat things about uh, Purdue is that we've been able in this area to provide uh, uh, additional settings for our students. Yeah, okay. Um, now, your facilities in sports medicine, um, you've got the you've got a training room over in Mackey. Um, just make a comment on the facilities. Um, okay. The of, of course, Mackey Arena was opened in the in the '60s, mm -hmm. um, and we have a sports we had a sports medicine center that was about 4,800 square feet that housed. It was built to house an athletic program of about uh, nine, eight or nine sports before Title IX, and when Title IX came around, of course, it doubled. So, so then after Title IX arrived in '75. Uh, you know, our numbers of athletes jumped from 250 to 500 plus, and uh, we kind of were falling out of the windows. So with the recent rac Mackey Arena renovation, we have we have uh, moved into a new facility in in Mackey, uh, and w as an example, we went from 4,800 square feet to about 17,000 square feet. So we've we've uh, enlarged it, shall we say. And we have a small facility in the intercollegiate building that uh, starting this fall as the renovation gets completed will probably primarily take care of our volleyball program, our football program, yet all the real rehabilitation and major uh, care takes place in the Mackey Arena training room. So it's a, it's a state-of-the-art uh, facility, uh, large, it can handle our 500 athletes. Uh, and, and as our facilities have grown, uh, obviously baseball just got, the stadium just got knocked down, it's about to open further out. Uh, tennis has moved from where it used to be, it's out on, on uh, <coughs> excuse me, McCormick Road. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, in the future, probably softball and track will be out there, and soccer is already out there. So we've expanded. There are some satellite facilities out there, but the main medical care still takes place in Mackey Arena. Right. Okay. All right. Um, you, the, uh, could you talk, make a comment on the athletic training education program? Sure. Um, Purdue is uh, one of it's the very, right. yes, one of the very first, probably uh, in the 70s when athletic training curriculums were being developed around the country. There were probably um, oh, eight or ten that started up first. And ironically, within the state of Indiana, Indiana, Purdue, Ball State, Indiana State, all started a curriculum. And all four schools are very proud of their curriculums, and we especially are proud about of ours. About similar times? About think? similar times in the 70s. And in fact, uh, probably Indiana University had a master's program that predates everything. Um, but the undergraduate curriculums all started in the 70s. And, and Purdue at first was in the, uh, in the Department of Physical Education, and it was a, a uh, option of study. So you could major in something else, complete the option of study. And then in the 80s, we converted it into a bachelor's athletic training program. And then in the 90s, it actually got the label uh, BA athletic training. And then we've since converted it to a bachelor of science in athletic training. And uh, I'm prejudiced, but I will say that that if you go out around the country and you say, give me a list of the top five schools with a curriculum, uh, virtually everyone will name Purdue University's program. Right. What's uh, the enrollment? Um, we, we, the enrollment is- and this is a ba at the bachelor's level. Is at the right? bachelor's level, and the enrollment uh, is typically, uh, we typically graduate from 
10 to 15 students each year. And our placement has been outstanding. Uh, about, if we graduate uh, uh, 15 students, we probably will put uh, six, four to six in a professional school, uh, medical school, physical therapy school, um, uh, occupational therapy school. We'll probably put uh, uh, eight or nine in a graduate school around the country and one or two in immediately into the workforce. Uh, very so good. placement is very good. Placement is very good. Uh, the demand for our young youngsters has been real good. Uh, we're able to get internships uh, in uh, the uh, NFL uh, quite handily That's for good. our students. Um, That's and, very good. And so we're, we're very, very proud of it. And uh, as as I retire, um, I'm excited about the opportunity to come and still continue to teach in that curriculum. I would think so. <laughs> Were you ever fact fellow at any of the residence halls? I was not. Oh, okay. Uh, let's talk a little about family. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we'll move on to the awards and honors. Sure. Well, uh, family, as we talked earlier, I have a, uh, Linda and I have a, a daughter Nicole she's uh, married she's a Purdue graduate uh, she graduated with a degree in uh, uh, health fitness and nutrition and she is a pharmaceutical rep she works uh, uh, in central India and lives in Westfield she has two daughters and her husband's a Purdue graduate uh, our younger daughter uh, Natalie uh, was uh, both of the both of our daughters were uh, gymnasts uh, growing up and uh, both were made it all the way to the state uh, gymnastics uh, uh, competition in high school. They went to Harrison, the local Harrison High School. Um, then Natalie, our younger daughter, also she decided that she wanted to try for cheerleading, so she was a, a Purdue cheerleader for four years, and culminated that uh, that little stint when her senior year was the year we went to the Rose Bowl. So she's a classmate of. Drew Breeses and, and Ben <laughs> Smith and some of those. So, um, and she then, uh, when she graduated, she she got into the pharmaceutical sales um, area as well, and, and is still there. Uh, she's married. Uh, she married uh, someone that went to that other school down south. Uh, she didn't ask us, so that's the way it is. But we're delighted. So. And she's expecting her first child in, in, in August, actually. Oh, that sounds good. Okay. Awards and honors. Um, the National Athletic Trainers Association Hall of Fame. Very nice. And the John Purdue Club, the Diamond P. The, the John Purdue Club Diamond P Award was uh, an absolute stunner. I just uh, about fell off the chair. and uh, I have. You were surprised. I was. That's great. I always I, ask people they're surprised. Yeah, I was just shocked, and and uh, I actually, someone was tugging at me to do something else that weekend, um, and my family really, really scrambled to make sure that I was there, and they were there with me, and I, I just fell over, and uh, it, it was a real honor, and uh, I. Uh, I, I proudly wear that diamond P. Uh, it, it's neat. You should, uh, right? Yeah. yeah. The, um, the you got the Golden Pinnacle Award from the Great Lakes Athletic. Tell uh, the researchers that because we have the uh, pinnacle here, but it's not the same. Well, the um, the uh, Great Lakes Athletic Trainers Association, which is the district one district of the ten districts within the National Athletic Trainers Association, that is what they consider their top award for achievement for uh, work done on behalf of the profession of athletic training uh, while doing a full-time job where, wherever you're employed and I was uh, awarded that and uh, it, it is a, a neat honor especially when you look at those who came before you I think that's really where you you see people that you always respected and you said, wow, and then all of a sudden they tap you and you said, well, right. you know, maybe we are doing something right. I don't know. <laughs> oh. And the recent one is that um, at the National Football Foundation, the Joe Tiller chapter, 
got a Legends Award. <laughs> I laugh. I think the Legends just means I must be old. <laughs> the, I was, that's very nice. <laughs> the uh, it, it was quite Did nice. Did you know that a little bit in advance? Well, I, I was um, approached uh, by the, the people that run the Joe Tiller chapter, and they said, hey, we want to make sure you're in town because... We'd like you to be with us. We'd like you to be with us, yes. Uh, it, it, it is an honor. It's a, it, it was very, it's neat to, to I think the, the thing I like about my job more than anything has been while in sports medicine you, you're trying to safely let youngsters do something that's not always in their best health interest. Uh, going out and running a marathon, 26 miles, is not necessarily good for your health. Uh, doing what Robbie Hummel did for, from the day he was five years old, it's not necessarily good for your long-term health. You could say the same thing about any sport. And so in sports medicine, yes, you try to help them safely compete. Um, and, and so it's not always a popularity contest it's always you always have pressure on you to make sure that they're that the youngster is able to play and you have pressure on you to make sure that you don't let them play when they shouldn't and so the gratifying thing about this job is when an alumnus comes back two three ten years later it doesn't matter when and says hey you know what when I got in the cold cruel world I found out that Purdue really took pretty good care of me and uh, that says it all that really does and so I think that Legends Award uh, Very kind, nice. of, kind of is speaks what that's that. about yeah. yeah speaks to that I think yeah. it, and you've been pretty active in the professional association like you were the president at the Great Lakes at one time and also the National Athletic Training y yes I uh, it's a funny story about the the you know that sometimes is somewhat political, but you get involved in your professional association. Sure. I came to work one morning, and and Mr. Newell said, uh, "Danny, uh, how would you like to run for vice president of District Four of the Great Lakes Athletic Transfers?" I said, "What?" He said, well, "I nominated you last night," <laughs> and I thought, "Oh, okay, okay um, whatever you say, you're the boss." Uh, but I got involved with my professional association, the NATA. And it is true that if you want to have an influence on your association, you need to get involved. Sure, I mean, right. You know, we tell youngsters, if you want to have a say in the president, you better vote. And so so I got involved, I, and I got involved at the district level and the state level. Uh, we got involved in, in the state of Indiana trying to uh, get uh, a license for athletic trainers. Uh, when we first started in the 70s, there, were, there was no licenses. And we now have an, a very uh, good uh, license for athletic trainers in the state of Indiana. So I got involved statewide, got involved in the district, uh, was the vice president and the president, and then I ran for uh, district director, and then I was asked to run for president of the NATA, and I did, uh, ran two terms. And I will have to say that uh, my advice when I went to the director of athletics to see if it was okay, uh, George King was the director. And I said, uh, I've been asked to run. Is it okay with you if I run and, and, and the like? And he looked at me and he said, um, I will tell you that he said I was the, of the college basketball coaches association. He was involved in that. And he said, I was the, the president or whatever they would call their position. He said, do it. He said, because that what might have been my most rewarding time of my entire career. And so I have to come back and say, the four years I was the president of NATA, I traveled all over the country on behalf of the athletic trainer. I met hundreds of people. And it truly was the most rewarding right. part. Yeah, I, I loved every minute of it. Let me ask you, uh, is Picky Newell going to make any comments? He really started the program, as you said earlier in the interview. And is he still, is he still around? He's deceased. Oh. Um, he passed away in 
uh, October of 85. Oh, okay. Uh, however, he was instrumental in the National Athletic Trainers Association moving uh, towards establishment of educational curricula in moving towards establishment and trying to seek licensure or regulation in all states. And he, his mind, he was active in the 60s, 70s, 80s, but his mind was working in the 90s, the 2000s, and above. He was way ahead of his time. And so- He knew I, what was he, needed and what- He, he really road. did. He, he was, so so far reaching in his thought process so i learned and still learn from him and i as a sidelight last week they had a little retirement within the department for me and my wife um, much smarter than i am i might i have to tell you she asked that his widow be uh, given an invitation and she came and she's got to be 90 91 years old and she just looked fabulous was i was just does she still live in the touch. community she lives in the community she lives uh, on the northwest side of north of the uh, elks golf course oh, and uh, just i was just delighted good. and she it was so really she, neat. i i think so i it was really neat i'm sure she did yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, how about um a favorite purdue tradition you can have more. Science people say it's one. You can have more. Oh, um, that might be hard for you. That is very difficult. But I, I just think the um, for me to walk across campus with the fountains, knowing what it looked like in '73 to the way it is now, and I hope they don't lose that transition right. to a beautiful. Campus, good, yeah, good thing. I like that. How about an outstanding event? You can have more than one of those. Too. Oh yes, uh, obviously, uh, I was still traveling with basketball when we went to the Final Four in 1980. That was really a neat thing, but uh, I think when we won um, the bucket game and went to the Rose Bowl, and, and subsequently. Being in the Rose Bowl was just, uh, it made your hair stand on end. You're just not competitive if that didn't, if that didn't do something <laughs> I for hear you. you. <laughs> um, little comment in your own words, sports medicine in the 21st century, what, any comments? Oh gosh, uh, what we, what we're doing now compared to what we did five, six years ago is 180 degrees change and and I don't think that next 180 degree change is going to take five years I think we are so much we're so far we're moving so fast I guess I should say with the things we are learning about how how exercise and the use of exercise and the addition of of, of psychological services and nutritional services and and um, and how that can allow a, a young student athlete to to develop mentally and physically uh, we're just we're just scratching the surface I, I, I'm so excited about the future of it and and uh, I just the the body of knowledge is so much bigger than it was yeah. Um, the athletic trainer, we now have masters, bachelor's, masters, PhD programs. Now, if you're a if you're an engineer, you've had them for a long time. We're a younger profession; it's taken us longer okay. to, to get there. But it also lets you be more excited about That's it. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything that you'd like to in closing, or something I forgot to ask? Well. I would. What, what about I, retirement? Do, oh, um, retirement! Yeah. I'm I'm really excited about the change, uh, the the fact that I don't really look at it as retirement. Uh, I, I it's a change in status. It's yeah. It's okay. Yeah. It's I look forward to having some control over my time frame. That that's the retirement part. 
But the, the opportunity to work with students who want to get into the profession and the unique thing about work, and, 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 and if you work on a college campus, you said, if you don't look in the mirror, you don't get any older. You, you continue to look around and you see 18 to 25, 30 year old people. Uh, so I don't look in the mirror and I feel great. Uh, got two new knees, I'm ready to go. Uh, so I'm so excited about that. Uh, but I would say about Purdue, the neat thing was when I interviewed here in 73, Mr. Newell said to me, um, I'd like you to come to Purdue because not for the salary, not for the location, but for the people. And he said, uh, you'll come for the job, but you stay for the people. And he was so right. Good comment. Yeah, he, he was just right on. And the, the, the people that I've had the opportunity to work with, our physicians, our coaches, our student athletes, they, they've been really great. And, and the, working in the health center expanded my horizon to uh, what well, I saw this morning. The, uh, uh, the golden girl is Miss Indiana. She's been patient. It is unbelievable how many times I can go somewhere and just walk into a restaurant in Indianapolis or somewhere else. Well, I'll tell you an honest story. About five years ago, my wife and I went to uh, uh, Cancun, Mexico, and we were walking down the beach. I had a Purdue t-shirt on, and somebody yelled at me, and it turned out to be a couple who were Purdue graduates much younger than us, and the the couple looked at me, and the young lady said, gosh, you look familiar. Gosh, you look familiar. Turned out, she worked her way through college, working at McDonald's on Northwestern Avenue, and she not only remembered me coming in there a lot in the morning, she remembered my order. So, Isn't that great? It was, it was just it's wonderful. It, it was wonderful. It, okay. it really was. So, yeah, yeah. the opportunity to work with Purdue students has been fabulous. Right. And it yeah. continues on. Yeah, it does. Yeah, and that's, that's the exciting yeah, part. Right. Of it. Yeah. Dan, I want to thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate that. Oh. It's been very nice. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you.